In this episode, I'm here at SCALE, the Southern California Linux Expo here in uh, Southern California in Los Angeles. In this episode, I've got interviews with keynote speakers. I've also got some behind the scenes looks at how SCALE works and what the history of it is. And I've also got some lightning interviews that you're gonna wanna stick around for at the end of the episode. It's gonna be a great time. I'm Aaron Newcomb and you're watching The Source. All right, so I'm here with Lee Honeywell, and she gave an excellent talk uh, this Thank morning, you. keynote speaker here at Scale. And so I thought I would sit down with her and uh, see if we could um, talk a little bit more about your conversation with the audience this morning. I mm -hmm. thought it went really well. Thanks. So, so instead of me telling uh, everybody about it, why don't you tell me what was the theme of your talk this morning? So um, I was going over sort of my experiences uh, with hackerspaces, mm -hmm. um, did a little tour through the history of hackerspaces, both in North America and overseas, um, some of those sort of cultural context of hackerspaces, right. and uh, then went into some lessons that you know free software communities can take out of the hackerspace movement, the hackerspace experience, and vice versa, and sort of some of the, the ways that hackerspaces and free software projects can mutually benefit each other. Right, right. So I want to get into a little bit of that, but real quick first, what's your background? I mean, you're, you're involved with the hackerspace, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're close to where you live, right? Yeah, so I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I'm one of the founders, uh, current president and board member of HackLab TO in Toronto, uh, which is a 35-member hackerspace in downtown Toronto. There's a, a couple of different sort of hacker and maker spaces in Toronto, mm -hmm. but um, Hack Lab is the, the one that's most sort of right downtown. Right. Uh, we're in a really interesting neighborhood called Kensington Market oh, that yeah, uh, has really good food. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's you know there's a store around the corner that we can go and buy Arduinos from, oh, and it's great. just it's just a really convenient location. Oh, definitely. Um, we have been around since 2008. Uh, we're just coming into our fourth year uh, fourth year birthday party this summer. Wow. Um, and yeah, we've got. About 800 square feet of space. It's not. It's not a very big space uh, relative to a lot of spaces out there, but uh, it's cozy, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got some good gear. We've got a laser cutter, a 3D printer, um, hot air rework station, all that, all that good really? stuff. So, what are yeah. what are most what are maybe some projects? What type of projects do people do there? Is mm -hmm. it mostly electronics, or I mean, it sounds like maybe a mixture of things. It's a pretty good mix of you know just people working on s using the space as sort of an informal co-working space. We mm -hmm. we joke that there's no SLA on quiet time, mm -hmm. um, but so you know there's a few folks that work there during the day just on their day jobs, uh, and there's also a lot of folks that work on open source software, uh, open source hardware, and just other hardware projects. There's a, a real mix of different projects going on there. Wow, great! Yeah. So one of the things that you mentioned this morning, and you don't have to go into all the detail now, but mm -hmm. Um, that there is this sort of uh, um, crossover or, or the concepts of open source and hackerspaces are ha share a lot, right? They yeah. have a lot in common. So what are some of the common things that open source projects and hackerspaces um, share? So one of the big things, uh, just in terms of organization, you know, you've got different styles of organizing your open source project, whether it's the, the cabal or the, you know, the cathedral versus bazaar, different sort mm -hmm. of styles of, of organizing free software projects. And, and that, obviously, some of this is just sort of generic organizational dynamic stuff, but so a lot of it is, you know, how to build communities of non-professionals or professionals who are doing this stuff for fun. Uh, communities that are not strictly based around work. Obviously, there are lots of folks who get paid to write free software, uh, but there's a lot of folks that do it for fun. Mm -hmm. And likewise with hackerspaces, well, there's probably fewer people that get paid to do hackerspace stuff. Right. I don't know of any, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> but, right. um, it's a labor of love. It's a labor of love, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, that's, that's true with open source. I mean, yeah, it's absolutely. This, it's the same thing, a lot of people for, do For it. a lot of people, it's just, you know, it's, building something to, to scratch an itch, right. or building something that you want to use, mm -hmm. or building something for the love of it. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. for the community a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so how this is a question that I had, and we talked a little bit about this off camera, but mm -hmm. I mean, how, how does someone get started? Right? I want to start a hackerspace. I've yep. got a million questions, uh, liability, uh, costs, uh, membership dues, mm -hmm. um, uh, security would be a big one, right? If you've got equipment, obviously you don't want people Get mad and leaving with it. Yep. So I mean, how do you how do you get started? 
So there's there's a lot of documentation. I, I highly recommend you know people that are wanting to start a, a new community to go check out the Hackerspaces wiki. There's actually a documentation page that has stuff like the Hackerspace design patterns document that I mentioned, which has a bunch of sort of recipes for, you know, um, should you have a shower in your space? Hackers will hack all night. They will want to bathe right. so that they aren't stinky. So or have a shower. You may want them. To your, bathe. You may want, them, you, you may want your, your your friends that are working there to we bathe. So that. you should have a shower, and you know. Plants, probably not a good idea. They tend to die. Mm -hmm. Give it a try, but you know, people's experience has been that, that plants don't tend to survive. Right. We actually have a little flappy solar powered flower that like <laughs> when the lights out it like like nods. Right. And you don't have to um, worry about watering it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Although actually it's funny, one of the folks at the lab figured out a way to turn it around so that the solar panel was facing outside ah, instead of inside. And nice. Yeah. Good. So it flaps better now. <laughs> so a couple more questions. Um, yeah. First of all, what um, favorite project or favorite thing that you've seen or done, or maybe not even you yourself, but maybe mm -hmm. something you've seen that you're like, ooh, I really want to try that, or it's really cool? Oh, that's a tricky one. There's, I mean, there's so many inspiring, amazing projects that people have built, even just at, at the space I'm involved with. Um, there's a, a bunch of different spaces have had space programs mm -hmm. where they've actually sent, you know, hot air balloons. Uh, right. Helium balloons into near space. The weather balloons um, with the cameras and stuff. Both HackerBot Labs out in Seattle and NoiseBridge, they have SpaceBridge, yeah. which they've, they've sent awesome. some near space balloons, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, other than that, I mean, the, the MakerBot project, which came out of uh, NYC, so a bunch of folks that mm -hmm. were involved with NYC Resistor has spun off into being its own like right. full on company. They're, yeah. they're making a lot of robots, right. and yeah, that's, really cool. that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, it, from my actual space, there's uh, a lot of folks are working on newer generations of the RepRap project. So mm -hmm. MakerBot and RepRap are sort of like cousins. Right. They, they share a lot of similar hardware, a lot of the same DNA, mm -hmm. uh, same open source DNA. It's all GPL mm -hmm. and Creative Commons hardware. Um, the the a bunch of the folks at, at HackLab TO, uh, Rob and Chris and a couple of other people are working on newer generations of the the RepRap. Prusa model, mm -hmm. which is like a, a new sort of research branch of the RepRap project. Mm. And they've been doing some really interesting things in terms of optimizing how much plastic is used to, mm. to print the RepRap. Right. Um, and our, our, our maker bot at HackLab has, has had a couple of babies already. There's, there's <laughs> been a number of sets worth of parts that have been printed on it. Wow, that's cool. Um, and actually, uh, one of the other folks at the lab um, has been, he's really interested in mathematical education, and he's been Printing 3D models of mathematical equations. Ah. You know, not everybody is a, a is a visual learner who's going to see that graph on the page and right. intuitively understand. Oh, that's how they're related. Right. A lot of folks are kinesthetic learners mm -hmm. who learn by touch and feel. Feel and so having this, you know, model, like tangible model of your, you know, your sines and your cosines and your differential right. equations and all all of this cool stuff. That's actually really powerful. Yeah. 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 Very so. cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last question. Yep. Um, any URLs that you want to plug or share? Where can people go find out maybe more about the hackerspace that you're involved with mm -hmm. or personal blogs or anything like that? So hackerspaces.org is the big central hub mm -hmm. of the hackerspaces community around the world. There's a, a wiki at hackerspaces.org. There's also information about our IRC channel, which is just pound hackerspaces on Freenode. Um, they have a Jabber server and a monthly call-in, like phone conference call-in. Cool. Uh, and the space that I'm involved with is hacklab.to. Great. Great. Awesome. Well, we'll put those URLs at the bottom of the screen. Awesome. Thank and you. And thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm here with Jane Silver from Canonical. And she just got through giving her keynote at uh, Scale. So I uh, wanted to sit down and spend some time with her. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, great. So um, your role is CEO of Canonical, right. right? And that's a recent shift, correct? Almost a year now. I okay. became CEO in March of last year. OK, great. And how is it going so far? It's good. It's yeah. uh, lots of lots of interesting challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always good, I think, to to take on new challenges. Right. Um, I've been with Canonical since 2004, so okay. it's not a, it's not completely new. You're not new to the organization. I'm not new to the organization. <laughs> I'm not new to Ubuntu. I'm, I have a lot of history with it and That's have um, seen Canonical through a lot of growth mm -hmm. already. But it is different when you sit in the top chair. Right, right. A lot more stress, <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> so you gave a talk this morning about cloud. Right. So what was, what, what were you talking about? What was the theme? The gist of it is, is 
um, Ubuntu as the cloud OS. Mm -hmm. We think that that a lot of the cloud concepts have emerged at the same time that Ubuntu has emerged over the last couple of years. Right. And, it, and Ubuntu is a natural fit it for the cloud, both for individual consumer users and for um, infrastructure users and, and providers. So because there's so much developer interest here at scale, I looked at it from a DevOps perspective. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interest over the last couple of days in DevOps and some right. of the, the emerging trends there. Yeah. And the relationship between DevOps and the cloud is a, is a really interesting one and one yeah. that I think uh, reinforces each other. And mm -hmm. so I talked a bit about that and how Ubuntu fits in and what Ubuntu provides to, to help support those trends. And so what about that? I mean, wh how, why Ubuntu uh, you know, versus uh, maybe another Linux vendor or maybe another operating system? Uh, there's certainly a, a lot to choose from today and everyone's focusing on the cloud. Right. So you know, why, why Ubuntu? There are a couple things that make Ubuntu particularly well suited for the cloud. It, one of them that, that generally always comes up first is just the really good match between um, the technology and economics of Ubuntu and what you want to see in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So the, this core co cloud concept of, of flexibility and elasticity, the ability to burst capacity to meet your demands, is something where you you need the ability to set up and tear down machines in a in a mm -hmm. essentially friction free environment. Mm -hmm. So that means not going out and buying a new license for each machine that you're going to run for right. for ten minutes or mm -hmm. three hours yeah. or whatever. And that that match between the Ubuntu model where we ensure that the bits, that the software is free and the, the commercial activities happen around the services that Canonical provides uh, is very well suited to the, to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Additionally, Ubuntu's always been strong in the area of innovation and as the developer's choice um, and as clouds the sort of this hotbed of DevOps activity and mm -hmm. a, of innovation, we find that Ubuntu is generally considered the most popular uh, guest OS right. in the cloud, mm -hmm. um, in part because of this, this strong developer ecosystem around it, um, and as being the, the Linux of choice for, for developers and, mm -hmm. and technology innovation. Right, right. So if I was to go to Amazon or Rackspace or uh, one of these infrastructure providers, mm -hmm. um, how would how would Ubuntu fit in? Would I be able to? You would be able to very easily um, deploy uh, an Ubuntu, an Amazon, an Ubuntu AMI, an Ubuntu machine mm -hmm. image um, with either our up-to-date development versions or our stable released versions, um, which we maintain with security updates and, and things like that. We have the most up-to-date Ubuntu images on the um, on there. And you'll see a lot of Ubuntu images that other people have put up as well as, right. as evidence of, of this healthy ecosystem and developer mm -hmm. ecosystem yeah. um, around Ubuntu. Definitely. The ability to mod and create yeah. has always been a, a very uh, strong um, uh, aspect to Ubuntu, you know, to have various uh, front ends, window managers, specific you know de uh, uh, deployments that are specifically purposed towards a a, a certain goal. Like uh, I use Mythbuntu at home, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean that's a variant of Ubuntu that's you know specific has a specific design uh, and a specific purpose. Right. So I think that's I think that's a really good thing about the Ubuntu ecosystem. Right. Um, so how big how important is cloud? For Ubuntu, I mean, obviously, you know, Ubuntu has always been focused on, uh, or, or not always, but started out with the consumer space, right? As mm -hmm. a kind of a user type operating system, has been going more towards enterprise environments. I've noticed lately, mm -hmm. and now with cloud, how important is the aspect of cloud to Ubuntu and Canonical's business? Um, it's. I would say it's very important. It's hard to it's hard to quantify sure. that with with a with a number. Um, but where we see uptake in enterprise environments, there's there's usually a cloud aspect to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's so well Ubuntu so well suited for the cloud, particularly Ubuntu Server, both as a as a guest OS and as a host um, cloud provider with our Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud stack. Mm -hmm. um, that it is, we see great opportunity there. At the beginning of my talk, I, I talked a little bit about this, an article in The New Yorker that I read recently, and I know The New Yorker is not an authoritative <laughs> I, <laughs> IT right. source. It's right. not the journal. I expect people expect me as a CEO to be quoting you know, the Wall Street <laughs> Journal or CIO magazines or yeah. something like that. But there was this article in The New Yorker that was talking about the internet and technology in general mm -hmm. um, and identified people as being 
put them into three groups of better nevers, never betters, and ever wasers. And the never betters are the people who think whatever new technology um, is bringing us to the brink of a new utopia, that this is just going to solve everybody's problems. This is, we've never had it better than this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think of the cloud that way, that this is just going to revolutionize IT. The never betters, it's a little bit of a tongue twister, <laughs> the never betters are, um, oh, sorry, the better nevers right. are, we'd be better off if this never happened. It's gonna be a disaster. You're gonna have no privacy. You're gonna have no control. It's, you know, right. no freedom at all. It's right. just, this is just a big disaster. And the ever wasers are, um, it's the same as it ever was. Like things are always changing. We're always going through gradual change. And this is just another thing coming right. along the like cycle. Like the Larry Ellison view of, uh, of cloud. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that from, from my perspective, um, I think we, it is a little bit, I am a bit of an ever wuzzer, you know, that the change is natural, that things are always changing, and particularly in the IT industry. But I have a, a huge slice of, of never better that I think this change in particular, the cloud change, mm -hmm. is really a very fundamental disruptive um, change to the way people are, are doing IT and will continue to do it in the future. It's, in some senses, it's a natural evolution of the, the capabilities that have been developed in the way the world is going, but it is the scale of the change and the disruption that it will cause, I think, is, is far, from, far from usual. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're very fortunate in many ways that Ubuntu is um, such a good fit for some of these concepts, and I think the cloud um, particularly in our corporate usage, becomes mm -hmm. becomes increasingly important for us. Right, right. Okay, so what's next for Canonical and Ubuntu? What's what's coming up? I mean, what what kind of things are are you going to be doing? Um, you know, in the next you know, 18, 24 months. Um, so we have. Uh, all sorts of things okay. <laughs> coming up. Luckily, luckily, because we release twice a year, it gives us it gives us lots of opportunity to roll to roll out new capabilities. Right. So, from a cloud perspective, from a server perspective, mm -hmm. in our release in April, um, in addition to Eucalyptus, which is the core technology of um, Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, right. we'll be including OpenStack as a tech preview. Mm. Um, and as as OpenStack matures, that's a that's a very uh, interesting. A cloud stack there, right. as well as a bunch of, of additional improvements um, aimed both at, at, at server on metal usages, but also cloud, a lot of work around power and power consumption mm -hmm. um, and, and general um, relationships and integration with ISVs and, mm -hmm. and third party software. From a client perspective, the, the Ubuntu desktop that, mm -hmm. that lots of people know. Um, we're at 11.04, we'll see the release of Unity in the default right. desktop for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that marks a really interesting um, transition point for us. So uh, on one hand, the, the notion of having a different desktop and netbook environment will, will disappear in 11.04. We won't release a netbook edition because the single edition will span both, we'll both form factors mm -hmm. and it will have slightly different behavior in terms of, of initial window size, depending on the size of mm -hmm. your screen that, that, that you're working with. But um, the notion that the, the core platform spans different device types or different device form factors um, is, is an important transition point and also just a very significant change in terms of user experience. Right. Um, we've been talking for several years about the importance of design mm -hmm. and user experience mm -hmm. um, in open source software and really trying to, to raise the standards in the bar ac across the ecosystem. And it, it takes a while to do that, you know, and that the changes don't happen overnight. Right. But I'm very excited around, around what's happening in the Ubuntu client system mm -hmm. um, now. From a um, canonical perspective, from a business perspective, we're seeing good, solid increases in the number of machines that are being shipped with Ubuntu pre-installed around the world, um, and an increasing number of people building on Ubuntu. So taking taking mm -hmm. Ubuntu core basically and putting their own their own user experiences on top, right. and that as that ecosystem spreads, that's a very good thing for the project overall because it means more hardware enablement hubbing around Ubuntu, more, more component manufacturers releasing drivers in a Linux mm -hmm. world, mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a lot of solid, tangible movement across, 
across the part of the industry that most people don't don't see very much. Right, right. So I've got one last <coughs> excuse me, one last question for you, and that is the the move. Uh, there's been a, a a move. Some of this is is real, and some of it is conjecture away from netbook technology mm -hmm. towards more uh, mobile technology um, like phones and tablets. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that is is worrisome or, or is it a natural progression of things and Ubuntu will play in that space nicely as well? I think it's a natural progression of things. I think it's, um, it's the in a, in a sense it's the impact of some of the cloud concepts on the in the consumer sp space mm -hmm. that the notion that that you have a single computer that it used to be everybody's desktop, and then mm -hmm. you sort of, mer you know, um, spread out to have laptops and things like that. Right. It's it's a it's a it's a whole spectrum now. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's um, as discrete segments mm -hmm. as it as it was at one point. And I think the notion that 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 spectrum gets blurred with different screen sizes and different form factors, from tablets and phones to computer screens in, in refrigerators and set-top boxes and cars f to your laptop, I think that that um, blurring of the spectrum is a, is, a, is a good thing and it's mm -hmm. a natural thing and I think it's something that I'm into plays well in. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, Jane, thank you very much for thank talking you. with me and with my audience today. Thank really you. Really appreciate it and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at more events in the future. Absolutely. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Well now, I'm here with Orv Beach, and Orv is one of the uh, people involved in the conference, and I've asked him to just sit down for a few minutes and we can talk about the conference itself. So if you've never been to scale, now's your chance to learn more. So Orv, welcome. Thank you. Uh, why don't you describe your role? What's your official role this year? Officially, I am the publicity co-chair. Okay. We got so busy, we've split it in two, and I'm one of the publicity chairs. Okay, and what does a publicity chair do at a conference like this? Um, actually, most of the publicity work is done prior to scale. Mm -hmm. uh, it consists of press releases, content management for the website, um, grooming uh, the inputs for the program, uh, blogging, tweeting, anything we can do to get the news out. Okay, good, good. So what's the history of scale? I mean, um, this is the ninth, right? The ninth, it is the ninth conference? Ninth scale. Um, so so what's the history been? Um, when, how did it start? How did it get started? Who's, who started it up and all that good stuff? It's actually kind of interesting. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, this is the ninth scale. Um, scale grew out of a series of what we call lug fests that were given by the Simi Caneo lug out in Simi Valley at the Nortel facility there in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, we thought there was a need and put on uh, some one-day festivals um, every six months. And by the time we'd put on the fourth one, we, were had, we had 400 people show up in a two-day show. Wow. Completely volunteer, put in a large cafeteria. And we knew there was a community need for something like this. Um, Nortel, being a pioneer in the dot-com crash, closed that facility and we decided to formalize it and make a 501c3 and scale was formed about two years after that. Hmm. Wow, and it's been growing ever since. It has. The first scale was held at USC in 2002, um, a one-day venue, um, 12 speakers to about 22 booths, um, and we've grown from there to where we are now. Yeah, so very common. A lot of the, a lot of the conferences have grown out of lugs where there might be an area where there's three or four lugs and they get together and say, hey, let's do a conference. They do. Right. There are regional uh, lug fests springing up all over the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, this year you're at a different venue, actually, right? You're at a different hotel. That's right. Uh, you were at the Marriott before. Westin. At the Westin before. Yeah. Okay. And and because um, I, I came two years ago and I think it was at the Westin. Right. And now you're at the Hilton this year. Um, why the change? Um, Growth, uh, the rising tide that affects everybody in open source has affected scale positively. Mm -hmm. We were at the Westin for several years, as you pointed out, and we outgrew the hotel. Uh, we've experienced five, anywhere between five and fifteen percent growth per year mm -hmm. since we started. Great. Um, we would have moved out of the Westin earlier, but we decided to be conservative based on the economy, so we stayed there an extra year. And this year, we're at the Marriott. 
excuse me, the Hilton, now nope. you've got me doing it, <laughs> uh, which is actually only down the street, folks. We're on Century Boulevard, shuttle close from LAX. Yeah, Easy to get great. here. It's a great thing. I mean, I took the I took the hotel shuttle from the airport. I mean, it's a long. It, it's it, you can't walk it really, but I mean, there's a lots of uh, shuttle service to all these hotels, and there's food around and things like that. So it's actually a really nice venue if you because I'm assuming there's a lot of people that fly in. There are um, unofficial stats say we have. Is it time to go into stats? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, looking at the stats, we have about 10 percent of the people who come from outside the country. About 80% come from less than 250 miles and the remainder in between. Mm -hmm. So while we call it the Southern California Linux Expo and we pretend it's a regional expo, we draw people from all over the world. Right, right. Now how about booths this year? I mean, you've got a pretty big space downstairs, but when I was down there, it was full. Packed. And, yeah, it was really packed. Well, here's the deal. Um, this hotel is about 20% larger than the previous venue, the Weston, and we filled it. Um, it is full. In fact, a few of the um, nonprofit booths, the dot orgs as we call them, are doubled up. Mm -hmm. They wanted to come and they were agreeable to sharing space. Right. Um, and to segue into that 20%, um, last year we printed about 1,450 uh, badges. That's how we track our stats. That's one of the metrics. Um, this, we're on, this year, looking at the stats just before we came in here, we're it's going to be somewhere between 1,700 and 1,800 badges printed. Mm -hmm. That's you know that counts exhibitors and speakers right. and staff. And that's press. about 200. And press, and press. <laughs> You're very important. Um, but still, that's that's tremendous year over year growth. We're very happy with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So not only that, but a scale is different for me anyway compared to a lot of conferences, um, smaller conferences where they might have a one day track, right? So talk about that. Scale has not only um, multi-day track, right, but they've got some training, a lot of training that was done on a Friday, and then we've got Saturday, Sunday. Not only that, but there's, a what, five different speaking tracks. That's right. So talk a little bit about that. What are the tracks, and, 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 and talk a little bit about the training that happened on Friday as well. Well, over the years, scale has evolved to meet the needs of the community, and about three years ago, maybe four, we decided to hold some specialty tracks on Friday. Uh, there was women in open source, mm -hmm. and back then there was Docs and Aussie, which is open source and software education. Um, that kind of started the tradition of having not speaker tracks, but specialty events on Friday. Um, that's kind of grown. Last year we had five special events on Friday. Uh, this year we had 12. What's happening is that people who would be coming to scale anyway, who are part of a, a, some group, a developer group or an organization, mm -hmm say, well, let's meet it ahead of scale. We're going there anyway. And we're more than happy to give them room space. There was a DevOps and UbuCon and I don't know what all else. Check the website. Um, as a result, our Friday check-ins last year were 425. Yeah, 425 and about 825 wow. this year. That's great. It was nuts. Yeah. Well, that's really good from a community perspective as well because it does give community groups the ability to meet with folks that are interested in a, in a narrow topic, right, a, spe a specialty right. topic, without having to compete with all the other stuff that happens on Saturday and Sunday. That's right. It, let, it lets them have a focused venue like Fedora Activity Day focused on some different specialty this year than they did th last year, but they have all of their group there. Right. Um, and we're more than happy to provide that service to the open source community. It's uh, one way we pay back you know, to the community. Sure, yeah. Okay, so let's wrap this up. So, so uh, folks that are watching this are either just so into scale that they just want to see it again, right? Of course. Uh, w which is great, or maybe it's folks that you know, couldn't attend this year. So let's say someone wants to attend next year, maybe they want to be a speaker next year, or maybe they want to have a booth next year. Where do they go, how do they get involved? Keep an eye on the uh, SCALE website. The call for papers will be posted there. And that URL is? Uh, SoCalLinuxExpo.org. OK, good. The SCALE is bottom. taken. Yep, great. <laughs> uh, and also, the SCALE-announce mailing list is there. You can sign up for it. Um, we won't spam you, but significant announcements as the program evolves for next year will be pushed mm -hmm. out there. Great. Um, we had 65 speaker slots this year. 100 and 175 submittals. Wow. So we have to be kind of brutal when it comes to, to paring them down. Right. Um, but we're flattered that people want to come and speak here. Yeah. It's, it's just, we, we view scale as, a, as a, an educational opportun, opportunity. Um, 
half the booths are commercial because we need somebody to pay the bills, but the other half of the booths go to any .org that, that can show us they have a good story to tell the community, mm -hmm. and they get their booth for free. Yeah, there were some hacker spaces here, for example. Yeah, exactly. Not necessarily open source software, but very re closely related, right? Things that, things that are closely related to uh, things that open source and kind of geeky people would be interested in. So it's nice to see a wide range. It's not just exactly. the Fedoras, the Ubuntus, the whatever. Uh, that are here, plus the commercial guys, it's, it's a wide range, and I think that's great. It is, um, and we go out of our way to intermix the two. There's not a dot, there's not an open source ghetto right. we've heard of in the past. Right. We, we mix them together very deliberately. Right. Um, some of our long-term vendors, uh, we're very grateful for their support. IBM's been here every year since Scale 9, and it's kind of interesting that the college students that wandered by the IBM booth in the mm -hmm. first couple years are now IT decision makers right. coming to scale. So that's a long-term investment for them. That's, yep. that's very smart. Well, not, not only that, but I also noticed that many of the vendors are hiring. <laughs> there so are. They're, they've got, they've got uh, 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 signs that say, we're hiring, talk to us, because they know that this is a good uh, pool of candidates to draw from, the people that attend these conferences. We have a wonderful demographic in Southern California. Uh, not only for hiring, there's a lot of uh, high-tech uh, firms around here, but we have a huge open source community in Southern California of users. Um, makes it pretty easy to make a, a show like Scale successful if you do it right. right. You know, if you build it, they will come. And boy, yeah. they have come this year. Yeah, excellent. Well, I know I have way too many things uh, to, to actually cover than I, than I have time for. We talked about that just a minute ago. Uh, there's so much going on that I have a hard time narrowing down what I put on the podcast. So uh, hopefully we'll do some, maybe some lightning uh, uh interviews at the booths. That's what I'm planning that for. That would be great. For part of the podcast. So uh, we'll put that up and uh, allow people to kind of get an, get an idea of what some of the booths are talking about, what other people are talking about that would be at the super. booth. So great. Orf, thanks very much for joining yeah. me. Thank you so much. I All appreciate right, it. Let's get back to the conference. Scale 10 next year, 10th anniversary. All right, I'm here with Donald Burr, and he is actually on the uh, Scale AV uh, committee, I guess you'd call it, but uh, is doing a lot of work with the uh, audio and visual here at Scale. And uh, he's going to kind of run us through how he does his streaming setup. Uh, all the uh, well, t well, you tell us, Donald, what's being streamed and, and how is it set up? Well, for the last few years, we've been streaming our, uh, typically we have two keynotes, at each, uh, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Uh, this year, um, I actually run my own podcast and I'm starting to do some video work of my own so I got some new software uh, that for personal use and I thought I'd uh, you know use that with the scale keynote stuff and sort of kick things up a notch. Uh -huh. And how's it going so far? Uh, doing great. Um, we had a few technical difficulties in yesterday's keynote but today's went just as smoothly as I could have ever seen. Okay, awesome. So kind of walk us through what, what kind of equipment are you using to do the streaming and how does it all work? So we're using a uh, mini DV camcorder. This is a, a Canon. And the, the trick with these guys is, um, you know, we're actually u using the video feed off of the FireWire port. We're not actually recording to tape. Right. So many of these guys, if you know, if you don't, are, you're not actually recording on the tape, they shut themselves off after mm -hmm. like five minutes. This is one of the few that doesn't. Right. Yep. Uh, I, I, it's exactly why I use the camera that I'm recording this with now. It's mm -hmm. an older model, but a similar camera. So. And, and unfortunately, they're getting so much harder to find these days. Yes. Yep. So we got that uh, FireWire coming out and plugging uh -huh. into my MacBook here. Okay. And I'm using a software program called Wirecast, and it's basically a television station in a box, essentially. Oh. It's a full-on switcher. I can do picture-in-picture, picture, and I actually sort of kick things up a notch here as well. I'm using a uh, program called Air Display, so I'm actually using my iPad as a control surface. So I can you know, switch, switch to here, and normally I'd have you know, a keynote speaker slides up here. I can bring in lower thirds. I can take the lower thirds out, and I can even do picture in picture. It's really slick, and it's worked amazingly well. Oh, very nice. Now, can you have you can have multiple uh, video sources? If as well? we had multiple cameras, I can even do that. Um, we don't only don't have a, uh, only one camera, and uh, you don't really have any camera operators to operate the camera. So, right. Um, but if we had you know two or three cameras, I think you can go basically as many as you can. Uh, physically fit on your FireWire bus. Wow. So this runs on Linux, correct? Um, this is actually a Mac program. Okay. Um, Wirecast is, is for Mac and Windows. Mac and Windows only. 
Mm -hmm. So much of the AV world is Mac and Windows only, unfortunately. Unfortunately, um, you know, they're, they're making some great strides in open source video production, but unfortunately, you know, that's one area where you know, it's still kind of lagging behind. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the video component. What about audio? How does that get fed into the stream? Um, well, you have a feed off of the soundboard, and that basically comes into my um, audio. I actually have a, a little uh, USB audio interface that I normally uh -huh. use, you know, a little outboard USB interface. Right, right which you need with MacBook Pros. As I see you're using, a lot of times the MacBook Pros are kind of sketchy when it comes to audio. Right, input. and in, in, in any case, no matter what computer you're using, you know, the, the internal sound circuitry, you know, you're always getting, you know, static, you know, off of the uh, computer components, so right. using an outboard interface is always recommended. Right, awesome. Now, what about the other uh, the other sessions at scale this year? Are those being recorded as well? They're being recorded. We're using a, um, a solid state recorder similar to, you know, the Zoom H4 that you're using there. Uh -huh. um, and we're also doing a kind of cool video monitoring setup that my friend uh, Chad Page over here cooked up, uh, where we actually have all the rooms, uh, we're using webcams in all of the rooms, mm -hmm. and we're, we, that way we're able to monitor them from a central location and, you know, see if, uh, you know, one room has a problem or if, uh, you know, like, like if audio isn't, you know, someone's audio isn't hooked up right or something like that. Okay, let's go take a look. Sure. Careful of the bag there on the floor. Mm -hmm. yeah, at this moment, we've got five rooms that we're watching. This one we don't have audio on, but the others are fine. I was able to catch that the power and Century C went out, and it's back now. Wow, so you're able to monitor basically everything from here, and if something happens, you can coordinate uh, efforts to go go fix whatever it is. Yes. All right, great. And we're actually recording the video streams as well. And so um, if the audio, uh, we've had some issues where like, you know, one of our audio uh, portable recorders ran out of power or something and didn't record part of a talk, we can actually pull the audio off of the video as a, you know, as a backup. As a backup, right. Exactly. Great. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, I think that out of all the conferences I've been to, you guys do a great job with audio video here at scale. So thanks, try. thanks for try. your efforts and you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up next year too. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. That about wraps it up for my coverage of Scale 9X this year. It's been a great show, a lot of good interviews, a lot of good content, a lot of great discussions. If you're in the Southern California area next year, I highly recommend that you come out to Scale 10X, which will be right here in L.A. Until next time, I'm Aaron Newcomb. Keep watching The Source. Oh, good. Hi, I'm Urias McCullough. I'm with the Haiku Project. Uh, Haiku is an operating system that's targeting d desktop uh, users, and we're uh, not based on Linux or BSD. Uh, but we uh, have built our own operating system from the ground up. Uh, we feel that it's a very efficient, very fast, and innovative operating system. It's got some neat features that uh, most, most operating systems still don't have, including an uh, extremely uh, pervasive uh, multi-threading and, and uh, heavy use of metadata and attributes in the file system. It allows you to run live queries and, and do some really neat stuff with, uh, with files. And uh, we, we think we've come a long ways uh, in the last 10 years. And our hardware support is very, very good now. And uh, the operating system is slowly approaching the beta phase. And we should hopefully uh, have something that uh, you, can, you can download and use for your daily operating system here pretty soon. So you can visit our website. It's at uh, haiku-os.org. And uh, check it out. OK, my name is Larry Kafiro. I'm with the Fedora Project. And uh, we have a booth here at uh, Scale 9X uh, with our uh, media. We have uh, also, you know, the usual standard swag. And um, uh, we have Fedora 14, which is the latest release of Fedora. It's, uh, we've got it in uh, every flavor you can imagine, 32-bit uh, live, desktop live CDs, a 32-bit installation, a 32, uh, a 64-bit installation. And uh, the show's actually been pretty, uh, pretty well attended this, uh, this time around. And uh, we're looking forward to the other shows coming up with uh, Fedora 15 in May. And uh, we'll just have to see you then. Um, Ubuntu California is an organization 
uh, made up of volunteers all over California who do events in the area. Um, we do um, advocacy for Ubuntu, the operating system. And then um, we have a website, ubuntucalifornia.org. On that website, you can find links to our events, uh, links to our mailing list and how you can communicate with us. You can find links to help resources within the Ubuntu community if you're interested in getting help with Ubuntu. Um, you can also contact us if you want Ubuntu CDs or if you're interested in having one of us speak at one of your events. And so that's pretty much what we do here. I have came here to, sh to show off, said in my robot, that it, this robot is based off Arduino Uno and it, it can detect walls. It's like a little walking robot. It has eyes, with like eyes, what I like to call. It. It's called ping. This is one right here. And these are also these are optical sensors. So whenever it will detect the wall, as you can see, it can move. And it's all rolling off um, two battery packs. This one's nine volt, and this one's nine volt. So. Hello, my name's Anthony. I'm actually here at the Linux Expo. I brought my robot that I built recently it's ran on an arduino uno board and as you can see i got two ir sensors that pretty much pro feed it the distance to prevent it from crashing into the bumpers that we have set here on our course and this is my first robot so i'm here with the linux astronomy a group of volunteers we kind of gathered together to create our personal projects and this is what we brought to the show to this today and exhibit for everybody to see and once again, my name was Anthony, and here's Eugene, the organizer. Okay, I'm Eugene Clement. I'm the founder of Linux Astronomy. And this year for the show, we decided to do a presentation with a robot. Uh, the theme we, we had was space and astronomy. And a student, where Salvador was a student in a previous class, we were uh, teaching together, learning together. Now this activity has been done after school, as an after school project. They are both committed, they were committed um, as a voluntary activity. Um, the Arduino board is a micro microcontroller board which is very popular now based on an Atmel AVR chipset. It's a very inexpensive board, about $30. And that's what we do. And uh, all the cool stuff OpenSUSE has been doing lately. That includes, um, you know, our upcoming release. Um, we're actually selling t-shirts here and uh, the proceeds go to scale. We're working on getting the word out on SUSE Studio, which is right over here. It's uh, basically a way to easily build your own Linux distribution. It's pretty awesome stuff. Um, and well, we have a release upcoming. It's in uh, just a couple of days. We're still giving out DVDs of our old release. It has a sticker on it, you know, where people can figure out how to upgrade to the new one. And we even have a virtual launch party for 11.4 on Second Life. So if you want to check that out, then, uh, you know, check uh, the OpenSUSE website and you'll find information about that. Hi, my name is Drew Jensen, and I'm with LibreOffice and the Document Foundation. Uh, I want to say to everyone in the community, thank you for supporting us at OpenOffice over the years and for the amazing amount of support that you've given us since we forked to LibreOffice. Uh, in eight days, we've raised our funds to open the foundation, and we're looking forward to moving forward with your help. Thank you very much. Hi there, my name is Nathan Betson. Uh, my handle is Nate Thomas. I'm the community manager for XBMC Media Center. Um, and we're here at scale, uh, as I'm assuming everybody else in this thing has been here at scale. Uh, and I'm just here to talk for a minute about XBMC. Um, as you can see, it's an open source software that uh, runs a variety of different skins. So it can look as cool or as uncool as you personally want it to look. You can add many different skins just by adding them through our add-on manager. Um, and you can run it on pretty much any system that you have. If you have a Windows uh, computer, a Mac, Linux, obviously Linux, um, or even an Apple TV will run on your system and we'll play just about any video file you have. So uh, feel free to take a look, xbmc.org. Uh, thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Carol Biggenhoe, and I'm a volunteer with One Laptop Per Child and Sugar Labs. I got started in this back in 2007 when I bought one of these green machines over here in the G1G1 program. Uh, since then, I've been taking laptops from one laptop per child around to fairs and expos and taking them to uh, different groups and things and talking about what we have. Uh, I have some interesting machines here. We have 
the green one, the original. We've had several models of that come out. We have, this is one happens to be an X01, the first one. We have some 1.5s, and the 1.75 will be coming out soon with an ARM processor, and it'll be a lot faster so that our hand crank, which never was really practical before, will be because you'll be able to get a minute of cranking go convert to 10 minutes of computer use, which is really good. Uh, now, over here we have one of the very rare red XOs. It's an X01 with two gigs of memory. And this one is the OLPC X015 in the model that they're using in Uruguay in the high schools. Every school in Uruguay in the public school system has an XO for every child. And so they're moving on to the high school level and they have the machine with the standard click clack keyboard and it's different colors so they'll know they're not the little kids. Now, the reason we're here today is to try to get people interested in participating in One Laptop Per Child in various ways. Uh, people can do what we call contributors projects. You can go onto our wiki, which you can find by Googling OLPC wiki. This is OLPC, One Laptop Per Child wiki. And within that, then go to contributors program and you'll find out how you can be a contributor either by doing a small project or maybe writing software curriculum and things like that. Okay, Linux Fund is a charity for the free and open source software movement. We've been around since 1999. We've raised and given away over three quarters of a million dollars. Much of that is from people carrying and using what's called an affinity credit card, which is like a rewards card, but the rewards go to the charity. It was a concept started by a bank called MBNA. There's about 40,000 different organizations that raise funding this way. Um, and we're just here asking people to sign up for the credit card and then we'll give them a t-shirt if they do. It's a standard credit card deal. Another thing that we're doing is open.org. Uh, open.org came up for auction recently. We bid, we won, and it's, um, it's a humbling experience to realize that you're holding on to something that's greater than your own imagination. So we're here at this event asking people to share with them what they would do with open.org if they were able to suggest something for them to do. And that's why we're here. Hi, uh, my name is Audrey Roy. I am Daniel Greenfeld. And we're here at Scale9x representing SoCal Piggies, the Southern California Python Interest User Group, and LA Django, the Django User Group. And uh, we, Python is a language that is dynamically typed. It is uh, used in everything from system administration to building websites to helping put robots and stuff out in space. Uh, we have um, we're a growing community. We'd love to have you. We're number four on the TOB index, and uh, that is Python. Hi, I'm Justin. I'm here with CrashBase, a hackerspace in LA. We're based in Culver City, um, and uh, we're here today to both spread the word about hackerspaces in general and ours in specific. Um, we have about 30 members, and we have both a machine shop, an electronic shop, um, classes where we teach how to how to use both. Um, this is the MakerBot, of which we have four. Um, it's one of our most popular objects. It prints 3D objects out of uh, plastic. For things that require more accuracy, we have laser cutters, we have CNC machines that can machine anything up to titanium. Um, we have people running businesses out of CrashBase. We have people coming for specific classes, how to build a Simon Says kit, how to uh, solder, how to read schematics. Um, it's some of our most popular things are things like handmade music, where anybody can play so long as you've made your instrument from scratch. Um, so we have events almost every day, um, and you can find more information on CrashBase.org. Hello, my name is Tom Bauer, and I'm with the LA Drupal group, and I'm here to encourage all of you to look into Drupal. Drupal is a framework for building websites. In fact, where you downloaded this podcast from is running on Drupal. You can use this framework to create any kind of a website. In fact, whitehouse.gov is running on Drupal. Go to drupal.org to download it. What else do we say? Oh, and check out LA, ladrupal.org. We have meetups once a, once a month. We meet in uh, Santa Monica. And uh, it's a great group of people. We have 1,000 members, all of them really helpful. And some way hot checks, too. Okay, should have said that. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> Hi, my name is Don Armstrong. I'm a Debian developer with the Debian Project. Uh, we're here at Scale to 
talk about the Debian project and everything that we do. We're the oldest fully volunteer uh, GNU Linux distribution. And this year in February, we actually released uh, our squeeze release, which is the Debian 6.0 version. It's actually the first release which includes K-free BSD kernels. So that's a GNU user land with a free BSD kernel. Um, and it's also the newest release in our series. Um, so we're just here talking to people about Debian and, and sharing our newest release.